Representation matters. But as indigenous Chicano people, we can't just sit back and wait for mainstream media outlets to make it happen for us. And nor should we. We started the Tales from Aztlantis podcast because we believe that it is imperative for Chicanos, Chicanas, and Chicanex people to produce our own media and tell our own stories. And the way we choose to do this is by using Buzzsprout to host the podcast. Buzzsprout is by far the easiest and best way to launch a professional podcast. You'll get a podcast website, audio players that you can drop into other websites, detailed analytics to see how people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and much more. To start your own podcast and get a $20 Amazon gift card, follow the link in the show notes. This lets Buzzsprout know that we sent you and helps support the show. Buzzsprout, the easiest way to start a podcast. Now, on with the show. You must excuse me. I've grown quite weary. This hasn't been easy, I know. But you've learned a lesson. A lesson in honesty. Honesty to yourself and honesty to others. That lesson will stand you in good stead all your life. I think we've all learned a good lesson. I've always heard that honesty is the best policy. Now I'm catching on to why that's so, and 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 why that's so. Yali no Chime, and welcome to Tales from Astlantis, the show where we explore Mesoamerican pseudo history, New Age nonsense, and other stories of adventure. We are your hosts, Curly Tlapoyawa, and Ruben Arellano, also known as Tlacatecat. Greetings, dear listeners, and welcome to Tales from Astlantis. The Mexica Wu episode. In this episode, we will delve into the Western origins of many of the alleged traditional ancestral teachings that are bandied about by prominent pseudo historians and New Age practitioners within the modern Mexicayot movement. So strap yourselves in and prepare yourselves for the origins of Mexica Wu. We begin here with Charles Etienne Brasseur de Bourbourg, who was a noted 19th century French writer, ethnographer, historian, and archaeologist. Bourbourg became a specialist in Mesoamerican studies largely due to the confluence between the popular interest in ancient civilizations, the idea of cultural diffusion, and the discovery of lost cities in the Americas. Borborg's greater corpus of work significantly contributed to the knowledge of the languages, writing, history, and culture of the Maya and Aztec civilizations. Nonetheless, his speculations concerning relationships between the ancient Maya and the lost continent of Atlantis encouraged the emergent pseudoscience of Mayanism, a non-codified, eclectic collection of New Age beliefs, influenced in part by ancient Maya mythology and folk beliefs of the modern Maya peoples. Adherents of Mayanism are not to be confused with Mayanists, scholars who conduct academic research into the historical Maya. People like Borborg were at the forefront of Maya studies at the time when mysticism was prominent in academic circles. Although many of his beliefs place him squarely in the pseudo-Mayanist camp, he was instrumental in the development of the field. One of Borborg's greatest contributions was his work on the Popol Vuh, a text written in the Quiche language and often referred to as the Maya Bible. Borborg found a copy of the Popol Vuh along with fragments of other codices in the archives of the Royal Academy of History in Madrid, but the most important thing he found was the Relación de las Cosas de Yucatán written by Archbishop of Yucatán, Diego de Landa, around the year 1566. Bourbourg subsequently published it in 1864 under the title Relación de José de Yucatán de Diego de Landa. That's my high school French right there. 
Unfortunately, Borborg's pseudo-historical interpretations prevented him and those who followed him from advancing the epigraphy of Maya writing in the right direction. Borborg's ideas surrounding the Maya glyphs were informed by the prevalent beliefs during this early period of archaeology regarding ancient lost lands. The lands that had been lost to the time included Atlantis and the Atlantic Ocean and a place called Lemuria that had supposedly been located in the Indian Ocean in remote antiquity. Despite making important contributions to the nascent field of Maya studies, Borborg was convinced that the Maya hieroglyphs held secret meanings surrounding ancient civilizations, in particular that of Atlantis. This belief was underscored by the archaic notion that ancient forms of writing around the world were all connected to a primordial human culture. Although it varied from person to person, the line of argument regarding the forms of writing went something like this. It starts with Atlantis slash Lemuria. This leads to the Maya, then the Egyptians, the Greeks, and finally with the Romans. Depending on the author, the sequence will vary, but the point is all the same. That Atlantis and or Lemuria were actual places that existed and that all world civilizations stem from them. In the minds of the people like Borborg, the more ancient the text was, the closer it was to the original super civilization from whence all human knowledge originated. This is where perhaps his views about the Maya views that were simultaneously very influential and intellectually engaging drew their cultural relevancy. According to Mesoamericanist and historical archaeologist Jeb J. Card, Berborg was convinced that there were secret meanings behind all the hieroglyphs that were all about the fiery destruction of Atlantis. He was misreading the Codex, he started creating this whole prehistory of all these things, and one of the words he deciphers is Mu, and he thinks this refers to Atlantis. In essence, the idea of a super ancient place called Mu, or Atlantis, is traced directly to Burburg. In time, Mu will be separated from Atlantis and rewritten into its own lost continent in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, by pseudo-Mayanists who were influenced by Bourbourg. One such individual influenced by him was Augustus Le Plongeon. He was a French-American photographer, amateur archaeologist, antiquarian, and author who studied the ruins of America, particularly those of the Maya civilization on the northern Yucatan Peninsula. Le Plongeon, along with his wife Alice, traveled throughout Yucatan photographing and exploring Maya ruins, and they are credited with being the first to discover and name the Chakmul statues. But while they engaged in orthodox archaeological work, they also advanced some strange hypotheses a la Barbourg style. For instance, Le Plongeon insisted that Freemasonry symbols could be traced to the ancient Maya, and that this knowledge had come to ancient Egypt from the ancient Maya by way of Atlantis. The La Plongeons constructed a really imaginative history, quote-unquote, that placed the Maya as the cradle of civilization, which then traveled east to Atlantis and eventually arrived in ancient Egypt, just in time to become the foundation for that society and Western culture in general. Combining their fieldwork with their own fantasies, the Le Plongeons fashioned a story of an ancient queen, Mu, spelled M-O-O, -O, and a prince, Ko, C-O-O, -O, whom they suggested was the inspiration for the Chakmul statues. Le Plongeons' writings contain many unconventional ideas that were not well received by his academic peers, and in fact, most of them were later disproven outright. Duh. Unlike his predecessor, Burborg, <laughs> Le Plongeon is regarded as one of the earliest proponents of Mayanism. His beliefs of Maya cultural diffusion radiating outwards would later influence the writings and ideas of other proto-New Age philosophies, as well as those of neo-Azteca nationalists in post-revolutionary Mexico. Following Le Plongeon's lead, 
the populist writer and amateur scientist Ignatius Loyola Donnelly advanced the Atlantis hypothesis further and combined it with the fringe concept of catastrophism, the theory that the Earth had largely been shaped by sudden, short-lived, and violent events worldwide. Donnelly subscribed to the notion that catastrophic events had affected ancient civilizations since the dawn of time. He is perhaps best remembered as the author of Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, published in 1882. This book undoubtedly sparked the interest in Atlantis that continues unabated to this day. By the late 19th century, his work was part of a growing corpus of unconventional ideas and beliefs that corresponded with the writings of other such figures as Helena Blavatsky of Theosophical fame, Rudolf Steiner of Anthroposophy fame, and James Churchward, who was an author along the same lines. But if you don't know any of these people, it's okay. Just know that what we now associate with New Ageism stems largely from the work that they conducted in the late 19th century. For instance, Blavatsky herself is credited with igniting the interest in Eastern thought and religion, which brought you things like Hinduism and yoga, among other things. Thank you, Blavatsky. However, the idea of catastrophism should be familiar to many adherents of Mishikayo, for it is a trope that often comes up in lectures given by so-called elders who conflate the non-scientific concept with indigenous mythologies. Usually the Aztec legend of the six sons or the Hopi creation stories of the four worlds are bandied about as examples of the supposed reality of these ancient cataclysms. Unfortunately, many of these ideas are still promoted within Mexica circles today. Atlantis Rising Open up any search engine and type in the words ancient and mystery in any combination and you'll get an innumerable amount of results ranging from books to so-called documentaries and an endless amount of websites that peddle pseudo-knowledge about the past in one form or another. Because so much mystery surrounds ancient cultures, Due to the mere fact of their antiquity, the average person will believe and accept almost anything uncritically if it sounds legitimate and conforms to their personal biases. This is not the place to elaborate on the difference between knowledge and belief, but it is telling that, despite humanity's many advancements, a significant number of people don't trust science and are highly critical of the scientific method. That is a problem that is sadly truer today than it's ever been in the modern world. In the Mexicayot movement specifically, there have been people who've made their name espousing these ludicrous ideas for a long time. These individuals go around giving talks full of pseudo-knowledge and outright fabrications about catastrophism. For example, back during the end times slash Maya time cycle ending of the year 2012, there were woo peddlers relating the date to the supposed return of the non-existent planet Nibiru, sometimes also referred to as Planet X. In Mexica circles, there were those who pretended to understand Olmec writings, even though actual scholars still have not deciphered them, and they assured their followers that the Olmec had prophesied the return of this non-existent celestial sphere. These woo peddlers conjure up mystery and antiquity to create a sense of authority that, when mixed with Religio-spiritual doctrine produces a belief that no amount of facts or reasoning can dispel. This is precisely the sort of thinking that was involved when the first Spanish colonial authors began searching for the source of American indigenous societies. The first person to develop these fanciful ideas about the origins of American societies was the Spanish historian Francisco López de Gomara, who wrote in his Historia General de las Indias, published in 1553. But there is no reason to dispute or doubt the island Atlantis, for the discovery and conquest of the Indies plainly clarify what Plato wrote of those lands, and in Mexico they call the water At, a word that seems, if it is not already, like that. Of the island. 
Gomara has been called the early modern father of alternative history and archaeology by skeptic author Jason Colavito. He is probably one of the first individuals to offer a counter-narrative against ancient aliens and lost civilizations in relation to native people. As far back as 2002, Colavito stated that, Early theories attributing Mesoamerican civilization to lost civilizations continue to deprive Native Americans of their cultural legacy today. Colavito also notes that famed astronomer Carl Sagan, who is possibly one of the first scientists to publicly denounce these outlandish claims, objected to the underlying assumption that our ancestors were apparently too stupid to create the monumental architecture of our past. It is distressing, however, that using science and being critical of supposed tradition makes one a persona non grata within your own community. Those of us who doubt these ideas receive pushback for daring to question what has now become orthodoxy in Mexicayot. Some of these misguided notions include the idea that Atlantis is related to Aztlan and that our indigenous forefathers were aliens from the Pleiades star cluster. Suffice it to say, there are a significant number of Mexicayot adherents who believe in this type of assertion, but I don't blame them for doing this. It is true that certain indigenous traditions promote the notion that human origins lay in the stars, in particular the Pleiades, People are well within their right to take a traditional and fundamentalist approach to their tradition, but it's also within our right, and dare I say obligation, as modern humans to also modify and adjust those traditional tenets to conform to reality. While it is true that belief in star origins predates the ancient aliens nonsense, the idea that Plato's Atlantis was Aztlan, or Aztlantis, began as a semi-legitimate conjecture with Gomara in the middle of the 16th century. I say semi-legitimate because we must consider the limited knowledge available in Gomara's time. However, by the end of the century, scholars like Jose de Acosta, who was the first to propose the Bering Strait theory, were already calling into question the validity of what I call the Atlantis hypothesis. In his book, Historia Natural y Moral de las Indias, from 1590, Acosta mocked the very idea saying, Men of good wits treat this as a matter of fact, and all things considered, they are silly ideas which seem more like tall tales or one of Ovidio's fables rather than history or any philosophy worthy of mention. After Acosta rightly dismissed the Aslantis hypothesis, no serious attempt to prove it surfaced until it was revived in the 19th century when Maya ruins in Yucatan and Central America were discovered. As mentioned earlier, Brasur de Bourbourg was the first to revive the notion of an Atlantis-Maya connection. Following his lead, Augustus and Alice Le Plongeon proposed that the original human civilization had been that of the Maya. According to the Le Plongeons, Maya society and culture had influenced all of the great world civilizations of antiquity. This idea was later picked up and repeated by MCRCA member and native Yucateco Domingo Martinez Paredes. By the end of the 19th century, fringe and unscientific hypotheses such as the lost worlds and the catastrophism had emerged to explain Atlantis and other theorites sunken continents of Mu and Lemuria, and in this area Ignatius L. Donnelly brought all of these threads together and wove a fantastical tale of an Aryan diaspora in his book mentioned earlier. There he proposed that Atlantis had been the original homeland of the Aryan people from whom all human knowledge had originally developed. And to support this idea, Donnelly laid out 13 points, and of these, the last four are the ones that concern us here. Point 10. That the Phoenician alphabet, parent of all the European alphabets, was derived from an Atlantis alphabet, which was also conveyed from Atlantis to the Mayas of Central America. Point 11. That Atlantis was the original seat of the Aryan or Indo-European family of nations, 
as well as of the Semitic peoples, and possibly also of the Tyrannian races. Point twelve, that Atlantis perished in a terrible convulsion of nature, in which the whole island sunk into the ocean, with nearly all its inhabitants. Point thirteen, that a few persons escaped in ships and on rafts, and carried to the nations east and west the tidings of the appalling catastrophe, which has survived to our own time in the flood and deluge legends of the different nations of the old and new worlds. Cool story, bro. <laughs> Donnelly's list is probably the earliest written example fusing pseudo-knowledge and white supremacy. Not only are the Maya no longer center stage, but they are relegated to an offshoot of the greater Aryan race. Thus, the notion that indigenous people could not have possibly developed their own scientific, architectural, and mathematical knowledge begins to take shape. I should also point out that the idea of Atlantis as an ancient Aryan homeland, is still very much alive and well among neo-Nazis today, also with white nationalist types. For all intents and purposes, Donnelly is the godfather of all Atlantean stories that have emerged since. It is telling that after his book came out, Atlantis again became a topic of interest in relation to Mexico. In 1884, two years after Donnelly's publication came out, the Mexican scholar Alfredo Chavero wrote of the possibility of the Nahua-speaking people having come from Atlantis. What was at first, as it was believed, Plato's dream is becoming reality. The relationship between Basques and Nahuas is likely, for it seems that the former are the Atlanteans that spread west into what is now the New World, and the latter the ones that occupied the east of Atlantis with the name of Iberians. In Chavero's telling, not only was Atlantis a real historical possibility, but the ancestors of the Nahua and the Spanish are interpreted as being one and the same. This was a time before Mexicanidad, or Mexicanness, as it is known today, had materialized, and there were a number of competing ideas about what it meant to be Mexican. In this example of this emergent Mexicanidad, equating the Spanish with Nahuatlatos, in other words, indigenous Nahuatl speakers, was not problematic. Chavero wasn't the only one with wild ideas about Atlantis and ancient Mexico. And in time, people like Juan Luna Cárdenas would emerge in the aftermath of the Mexican Revolution of 1911 to 1921. And through him, French ideas like those of Chavero became deeply entrenched within Mexicayot and other indigenous revitalizationist traditions. Damn. <laughs> There's a lot there. <laughs> There's a lot going on there, man. The the thing that <clears throat> really strikes me is that when we look at the origin of a lot of these so-called traditional teachings within the Mexicayo, and we see names um, like La Plongeon and Velikovsky and all these other European names, and we and we show people. Like, hey, man, uh, this stuff that you're, you're passing off as traditional came directly from Europeans. They, um, instead of looking at the evidence and being critically, you know, being critical thinkers, they, they double down, you know? They really just, like, double down on their beliefs and, and say, no, no, you're, you're the Western one mm -hmm. because you're questioning our ancestral teachings. Right. Right. And, you know, you're you shouldn't be asking these questions. And so they they kind of cling to these these beliefs, despite the fact that we we can show them where these ideas came from. Yeah. And they, uh, you know, instead of investigating further, they just the the knee jerk response is to attack people like us and demonize us for being critical thinkers, for for using the scientific method mm -hmm. for, you know, looking at, at history from a, you know, from a reality based perspective. And I think that this is something that, uh, I don't know, it, it's not unique to Mexicayo, certainly. 
um, the the Trump administration showed us that people do not <laughs> like to have their their ideas challenged with facts and information. Alternative facts. Yeah, but the fact that it is so deeply embedded within our own community and within our own traditions is um, it's really concerning to me. Um, kind of bums me out, man. I'm not going to lie. Dare I say Juan Luna Cardenas was uh, the originator of the alternative fact movement here in, within Mexicali? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you be. know, it, it's interesting that you bring up uh, Velikovsky. Was, was his first name Emmanuel, I think? Emmanuel Velikovsky. Emmanuel Velikovsky. And he wrote that book, um, was it in the 50s, something about the cataclysms or something? The Worlds in Collision. Worlds in Collision, there you go. We, we didn't bring him up in, in you know, the, the scripted version of, of this episode that we just went over. But I do recall, I don't know if you were present at that ceremony. It was back during the early days of, of our experience uh, with uh, Mexicayot and, you know, doing ceremony. But I do remember being at a ceremony once. And one of the people that was there, one of the roadmen who was leading the ceremony, I remember that they, and I was familiar with Velikovsky at that point, and I remember that this individual was basically rattling off the various cataclysms exactly the way that are they are laid out in Velikovsky's book. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, I remember talking to some of the people there, and I'm like, hey, y'all ever read this? You know, and, I was, and they're like, no. Nah, and then I tell them, look, this guy talks about everything that was just said in the ceremony about the cataclysms. I mean, it's right there in that book. And they interpreted that to mean that this person, Velikovsky, had, um, he had Access. to have learned it from a yeah. Native American <laughs> somewhere. I'm like, Really? That's that's he, your conclusion from That's from, what you're getting from this. <laughs> so he obviously had access to ancient traditional teachings, right? Because that's the only way. It, it it could never work in reverse. Exactly. And I was like, okay. Well, you know. Well, speaking of Velikovsky and catastrophism, man, one of the things that really uh, kind of kicked me in the gut was finding out that Vine Deloria Jr. Was huge into Velikovsky. Oh, if you yeah. read Red Earth, White Lies, which when I was young, I was all about that book. And I was just thumbing through the book today um, to prep for this episode. And when I originally read it, I had highlighted all of this stuff, right? Mm. Um, uncritically, obviously. And now I'm looking at all the stuff I highlighted and I'm just like, oh, shit. <laughs> Yeah, it's, Why? it's it's uh, it's been not not only eye opening, but it's it's been very um, disappointing, a little disheartening. Yeah, right? yeah. And then you've got you know La Plongeon, who directly influences uh, Domingo uh, Martinez Paredes. Paredes. Uh, we don't even discuss it in, in 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 here, but one of the things that Domingo Paredes. Uh, proposed in his book um, was it in the Un Continente y Una Cultura or was it the, a different book of his I forget which one where he introduces the the square and the circle and how these things are supposed to be somehow like ancient indigenous tradition mm -hmm. or knowledge well I, I found that in his Hunabku book was it the Hunabku book okay yeah and and just like he lifted the whole Hunabku concept from these guys, I think Brasur de Burburg was the, probably the first one to really associate Hunapku uh, in, in some of the early writings of his. And then La Plongeon picked up on it. And, and so along with Hunapku, Paredes borrows that and he borrows these symbols that are supposed to be like primordial symbols that represent like the the primordial entity of creation or i'm not i don't remember exactly yeah, how it yeah the um the the symbol that he uses in his book on hunapku is identical it's the to same the symbol from uh is it queen thing. mu queen mu that's what it yeah. is that's what it uh, is la plongeon's book queen mu he uses the symbol from that he lifts it directly and then he ascribes to it a meaning uh from the freemasons 
that Hunabku, that that symbol that he uh, identifies as representing Hunabku with the the square and the circle, represents the uh, the primary mover, which is a, a Masonic principle. So all of these ideas, you know, that came from the MCRCA and uh, Semanawak Tlamachtiloyan and organizations like that ultimately had their roots in these European uh, writers and occultists and people that were obsessed with the paranormal and pseudo-history and pseudo-archaeology. Well, speaking of pseudo-history and, and occultists, I have here a dictionary of symbols by J.E. Shirlot or Shirlot. He was a Mexican writer, but I think he had like possibly French or Italian ancestry. And it was published originally, I believe, in the 60s in Mexico. And I have a translated version of that book. And in it, he talks about squaring the circle. And this is what he has to say about that. The ancient Mesopotamians used to place a circle between two squares in order to find out its area. And the idea of equating the circle with the square also grew out of the concept of the rotating square. But our concerns is not with the mathematical, but the symbolic problem. Squaring the circle, like the lapis or the arum philosophicum, was one of the preoccupations of the alchemists. But whereas the latter two were symbols of the quest for the... Evolutive goal of the spirit, the former problem concerned the equating of the two great cosmic symbols of heaven or the circle and the earth or the square. And it goes on, but, you know, the fact that that symbol of the circle and the square is found in this book, a dictionary of symbols of the occult, uh, is uh, a little disconcerting. <laughs> <laughs> when was that when well, was that published uh, the original one uh in spanish goes back to 1962 and okay. the first english edition was published in 1971 i think yeah so getting back to um that point that I made earlier, all you know, a lot of these ideas that people accept as traditional indigenous knowledge has their roots in, you know, European occultism and pseudo history. And what they represent, what these ideas represent, are not traditional teachings of our ancestors, but rather the encroachment of Western New Age occultism and pseudo history and just you know the paranormal uh roots in in europe and they have nothing to do with our ancestors but yet the way that the mexicayote has framed everything is you know because i remember being told specifically i couldn't trust mm -hmm. historians i couldn't trust anthropologists or archaeologists i had to trust you know, the teachings of the Mexicayot because they were going to give me the truth. And this was pretty clever because by dissuading me as a young man from really exploring the legitimate information and primary sources and just relying upon what was being taught to me by elders in the Mexicayot, they were able to keep me from discovering that the stuff that they were pushing was actually bullshit that came from Europeans or that they just made right. up whole cloth. And, you know, when you're taught that, you know, no, you can't trust them. You don't want to read books, right? You're getting your information from books. It's like, well, you know, our ancestors had books, <laughs> right? I mean, you, this is, <laughs> you did know this, right? Or, or they'll be like, well, you're, you're practicing Western mm -hmm. science. And I'm like, did you really just surrender science to white people? Because our ancestors were legitimate scientists, man. You don't get corn. You don't get these complex calendrical systems you don't get solar observatories and monumental architecture without mm -hmm. being scientists and this is just it's just lost on the people in the mexicayot because they've got such 
you know, skin in the game, right? They've got something to lose if the truth gets out there. And I and think that also, scares them. it's um, also a bit dispiriting and, and, and in a way disillusion um, forming as well. If you're a young person who is curious and you're coming at this tradition from a genuine place of wanting to know and, and understand your culture, the origins of your people and they're, they're not, not just culturally speaking, but also spiritually speaking. And you get uh, immersed in, in the Mexicaya tradition and, and you're dissuaded from asking questions. You're not encouraged to seek other sources of knowledge. It's going to lead to you not really wanting to educate yourself. And, and there's a high degree of people within Mexicayot who do not believe in uh, advanced education uh, as the way we know it today through uh, whether you start off at a community college or if you move on straight into a university, a four-year university or what have you. But this idea that, that if you go to these spaces, you're going to be taught things that contradict what we are teaching you here. And so in many cases... Um, young people are going to be dissuaded from pursuing advanced degrees that are going to help them personally. They have nothing to do with them being involved in Mexicayo. And, and, and so that, that is also a problem within Mexicayo. It doesn't get talked about often enough because if you are a, per, a person that's in a position of power and authority and you, know, you tell your adherents and your acolytes that that you know, Western education is is wrong because they have our history wrong because they twisted it because it's lies. Then you're not going to want to exactly. You're not going to want to pursue an advanced degree and and get educated. And so that's something else that needs to be addressed here, uh, moving forward. Um, but I wanted you to also touch upon a little bit on the connection between catastrophism for example and how it is used uh alongside with like the hopi mythology and the 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 aztec mythology of the you know the five sons and the four worlds and 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 try to draw a parallel there between those two ideas how is it that people within the the mishikaya tradition are able to connect those two things. And, and, you know, speaking of dissuading people from pursuing Western knowledge, you know, some of these same people use Western knowledge to, and they reinterpret it in their own way and try to attach it Mm -hmm. to actual indigenous sources to legitimize it. Yeah. When it, when it conforms to their worldview, to their preconceived notions, they'll accept it. Well, with Catastrophism, which really came about from that book, Worlds in Collision, by uh, Emmanuel Velikovsky, I'm not sure when that book came out. Um, 1950, originally published April 3rd, 1950. So Velikovsky, you know, he, uh, his whole thesis is that Venus uh, was once part of Jupiter and that Venus was ejected from Jupiter as a, as a comet. And then it came by the earth and it caused like these worldwide calamities. Right. And if you look at, you know, the Mexica story of the five sons, you know, there, there were four creations, four worlds before this one and each one ended uh, in in some sort of uh, mm-hmm. catastrophe, right? So what it does, and that obviously predates, Vel, you know, Velikovsky. So what what that enables people to do is, um, you know, mm-hmm. it's confirmation bias, right? Like, like, well, our stories say this, and this guy wrote this book saying sort of the same things that worldwide catastrophes shaped you know, how the, how the world came, how the earth came into being. So it obviously validates both, right? (laughs) Like one wasn't meant to be like a creation mythology meant to impart lessons and teach things, right? Which was the, the Mexica story. Yeah. 
And then you have this guy's story, which is just pure pseudoscience meant to advance his own personal agenda. They, they look at them as like, well, they're similar enough that they validate each other. Therefore, that means that they are both literally true. Mm. And I think that's one thing that our people fall into is they want to look at our creation stories as if they are literal stories. And mm -hmm. it's basically like a religious fundamentalism, right? That's right. no different than people who look at the Bible and say, no, this literally happened, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, you have our own people who teach, well, no, literally there was a, an age of giants and then Quetzalcoatl went to Mictlan and took the bones of the giants, but they broke when he was escaping and they shattered into smaller pieces and then when he mixed his blood with the smaller bones that created humanity and that's why we're all different shapes and sizes because of the bones i mean it's a cool story right yeah do i believe it literally happened absolutely not there's no reason to believe that that literally happened and the danger comes from when we look at works like worlds in collision in order to validate our stories, mm -hmm. to, to, to somehow make them true. It's like, we don't need to do that. Like our, our stories are important enough. These creation stories are completely valid on their own without, you know, being confirmed by Emmanuel Velikovsky. These are stories that we can learn things from and that are an important part of our cultural inheritance. It doesn't mean we need to believe that they literally happened or that we need to seek validation for them by looking to the works of these Europeans. You know, they are what they are. Let them stand on their own, and they're important culturally. Why can't that just be enough? Why can't a beautiful story that's part of our culture be enough? That's the way I look at it, you know, end rant, I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, if you hide the bones of the giants... Um then you're not telling people the truth, Curly. Isn't that what archaeologists do? <laughs> you, you discover things and you don't want to... Um, and then we hide them. Hide them and you, you don't want to expose it because they might, um, you know, fracture people's uh, <laughs> uh, beliefs. What, what's funny is, is literally like two weeks ago, somebody brought that up on, on Twitter, challenging archaeologists. Like, why are you people hiding evidence of giants? <laughs> and I responded with, you know, hey, man, if I found giants, believe me, everybody in the goddamn world would know that I found evidence <laughs> of giants. And I would accept my Nobel Prize and my uh, PhD and my speaker's fees and my book deals and... Uh, you know, I would travel the world as the world's foremost expert on giants. On there's giants. no reason. There's no reason to believe that an archaeologist would hide uh, anything be because it might disrupt our perceptions of reality. Right? You could always tell these shitty online articles that have this, the the, it, and it's always the same headline. Right? Discovery of such and such will rewrite the mm -hmm. history oh, of yeah. the world as we know it. And it's always super clickbaity, nonsensical exactly. shit. Yeah. But it gets shared and it gets repeated all over the place. Um, interestingly, uh, did you know that there's a new TV show coming out from the Discovery Channel called Hunting Atlantis? <laughs> Jeez. That's, are you serious? <laughs> yeah, man. It's 2021. We're and still this, hunting for Atlantis. And this shit's still going on. <laughs> Here's the headline from The Hollywood Reporter. Discovery orders hunting Atlantis series from Morgan Freeman and Laurie McCreary's no. Revelations Entertainment. The show will follow a pair of experts as they try to find the lost city. So, Why, Morgan Freeman? Well, you know, he does play God, so I guess it's yeah. uh, it goes along with his persona. Like, when I first saw Atlantis, I knew <laughs> it was going to be my friend. <laughs> but uh, the, the show will follow expert Stel Pavlo and volcanologist Jess Phoenix as they set out on a quest to solve the greatest archaeological mystery of all time. Neither of them is are archaeologists, by the way. I was going to say, they're... are those their actual <laughs> names, though? Yeah, yeah. Jess Phoenix. 
Um, and apparently, uh, she's been, I've been watching, uh, archaeology Twitter has been having quite the filled day. It's been a buzz. Going off on Jess Phoenix. And, uh, she's been defending herself. Like, she's really, um, she just doubles down on it. Like, you, you don't know. This show's gonna be amazing. It's like, all right. So, so these aren't actual archaeologists? I mean, what qualifies them to be Atlantis hunters? What, what is that like? Well, I mean, I guess she, if she's a volcanologist, right? Wasn't a volcano part of the, the legend of why Atlantis oh, was destroyed? Well, yeah, I guess so. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. Here we are. 2021. Hunt for Atlantis. Hunting <laughs> Atlantis. And, but... Uh, you brought something something interesting up earlier, though, where, where you um, and I think we've hinted at this before. I don't think we've really elaborated on it as much. I think this might be a good place maybe to begin that conversation, not necessarily, you know, to do an entire uh, treatise on it. But, for example, this idea that at least within Mexica, and this is true f for a lot of religious uh, thinking, people who, who subscribe to very fundamentalist uh, religious ideas, they will accept science when it uh, confirms their biases mm -hmm. and, and they will reject everything else scientifically that challenges those core beliefs and tenets of, of mm -hmm. their religion. And there seems to be a correlation with that idea going on with what we just discussed here in in, in this episode with uh, this idea of the lost continents, this idea of the uh, catastrophism, uh, this idea that that there must be because there's there's uh, like you were saying there's a, an indigenous source that is corroborating what a Western European wrote you know, in, in the 20th century that somehow the two corroborate each other and therefore they must be literally true. Mm -hmm. And, and, and if, and if the Western person wrote it, they must have probably had, uh, an informant of some sort, whether it's an indigenous source or whether it's an actual indigenous person that they were asking, uh, for information, about this specific subject, for example, you know, this idea of catastrophe or this idea that, that our ancestors came from the stars, which is something that is still, you know, heldly believed mm -hmm. by not just Mexicas. I mean, there's this belief is, is uh, something that you can find throughout the Americas, both North and South, right? Uh, not just in Mexica, you know, there's other cultures that believe that have a very strong spiritual connection with the Pleiades and, 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 it also forms a, a core symbol for uh, some um, medicine ceremony traditions as well. And so, mm -hmm. and so what yeah, do you absolutely. say to people when you tell them, look, we understand that you believe these things to be true culturally and spiritually and, you know, in a religious sense per se, but it's not actually the case that we could have come from the stars because... Where's the evidence for this? Is there any actual evidence besides some old story, mm -hmm. some old fable, some mythological uh, interpretation that is more culturally, spiritually based than actually based in reality? Like, how do you how do you respond to someone telling you these things? Well, what what's funny about that is, you know, when you point those things out. The response you'll get is they'll try to out spiritual you and be like, nah, man, of course we come from the stars because we are amongst the stars right now. Are we not? We're on a rock floating through space, bro. And so you just don't understand things. We are from the stars. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, that's not what the, you were saying before. The no, old, don't, yeah, don't, yeah. <laughs> don't move, move the, the target, post, right? Yeah. Don't. Yeah, don't move the goalpost by redefining what you literally meant. Because I, I get that response a lot. They'll try to be like, well, you know, uh, yeah, we, we are made of stars, right? They'll quote Carl Sagan. 
and be like, well, we are made of star stuff, man. And it's like, yeah, but that's not the same thing as saying that our ancestors <laughs> came from outer space and then landed here in seeded civilizations, right? So let's not pretend that they're both the same thing. And unfortunately, what I find is, because your question was, you know, what do you, what do you say to these people? Unfortunately, <clears throat> my mm-hmm. experience has been that no matter what you say, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter to them. Their, their position is intractable, right? They've, they are not going to change their mind based on new evidence. In fact, what we see amongst these true believers is that changing your mind when you're presented with mm. new and better evidence is seen as a weakness. Hold the line. Because you're supposed to hold on to yeah. that position because it's, it's doctrine, right? And it's unchangeable. And if you dare challenge it or change your position when new information mm-hmm. is presented to you, you're weak. You're Western, right? That's not how we operate. We just believe things forever, for all eternity, no matter what it is, which is actually mm-hmm. in direct contradiction if you read the Florentine Codex. The Florentine mm-hmm. Codex is very specific about questioning everything. Mm-hmm. And it lays out, you know, what is a good teacher? What is a bad teacher? What is a good doctor? What is a bad doctor? And under every single one of those, it says the bad teacher is a liar, is a deceiver. The bad doctor is a liar, is a deceiver. But yet, you know, when we actually follow those actual indigenous teachings, you know, you get called Western because you're questioning things. It's like, it's this convoluted knot man that i Mm -hmm. i I really don't know how to untie it because it just seems like the more information we put out there the more people are resistant to it and there's always a response for example someone could easily say well who wrote those uh passages in the florentine codex yeah right Um, well it was actual uh nahuatlatos who were hired to to transcribe some of the history yes but you don't understand they were Mm -hmm. being dictated to by the Spanish, by, by, by the church. The church was um, telling them what, what was okay to write and what was not okay to write. Yeah. So there's always, there's always a response, even when you yeah. use indigenous sources to, you know, counter these, these assertions, there's always a comeback. Yeah. And then, the, and then if you ask them, well, then what, what indigenous sources can we trust? Well, we can only trust the pre Cuauhtémoc. And I'm like, okay, so who's going to interpret these? Oh, my my elder interprets them for me, <laughs> and he told me that it you know we came from the stars. So you mean like the elder <laughs> that interpreted the Omic writing and somehow was able to, you know, decipher that planet yeah. who was supposed to come back in twenty twelve? Like yeah, that? <laughs> and he kept repeating adamantly, "It was written, it, it was written." written. <laughs> it's like okay, it you know. Tell me more, sir. <laughs> and yet planet Nibiru never showed up. And, and what's funny is but the word Atlantis saw civilization that was on an island that sank in the Atlantic. Mm-hmm. But not Atlantis. But not a, yeah, yeah, not Atlantis. <laughs> it's something else. Well, he, and then he also claimed that, you know, Jesus Christ spoke spoke Maya while he was dying right. on the cross. Right, right. And uh, I guess he had a debate with, um, was it Magaloni? Magaloni. Um, over, so the in um, the book on the MCRCA by Odena Güemes. Right. She talks she, about this stuff. She references this mm-hmm. debate that occurred. Yeah. And um, so I was able to track down the issue of Iscalot. Okay. That had the, the original reference to this debate. And the debate wasn't whether Jesus Christ spoke Maya while dying. So that on the was cross. settled. They agreed that that he spoke Maya. Yeah, that, that was, was just the, what he said. What he said <laughs> was up for de- like the question isn't whether Jesus spoke Maya. It's what he said specifically. That's a given. You, know you know that because it's so, you know because if Jesus is the Son of God, he can speak all languages at once. I guess so. Although the. I guess what um, Paredes and La Plongeon and all those guys, what they were pushing was that um, the Maya visited the Middle East 
and taught those people. And that's why Jesus was able to speak Maya because mm-hmm. he learned Maya from people who had learned it from the Maya. I thought they were saying that they were trying to connect it with this idea that Jesus supposedly had traveled to India and had like the lost years of Jesus or something. That's right. India, it. not not the Middle East, India, the uh, the Nagas. India. Yeah. Nagas. No, you you were right. And, that, and then were somehow correct. so so going back to to the to the uh, uh to the to the the line here of Atlantis, Lemuria, Maya, Egypt, Greek, Roman. I mean, we're still that's that's part of the whole lost lands mm-hmm. ideology that even the MCRCA, I mean, they didn't necessarily promote it in, in the same way, but they, I mean, the MCRCA was also saying things like our ancestors traveled from Atlantis to Egypt and taught everyone, you know, what to do. So whether they're traveling to India, whether they're traveling to Egypt or what have you to Greece it's always you know our indigenous ancestors were the best ones we're the original we're we're the the uh, the primordial or uh, uh, civilization and and everything stems from us yeah it's like afrocentric extremism but in reverse right but in reverse exactly. instead of saying that you know the ancient africans came here and taught us all of our culture they just flip it on its head and say that our ancestors went and taught them their culture and both are totally, you know, idiotic. Another question is who was make. doing it first? Was it, was it, you know, the neo Aztecas doing it first or did the neo Aztecas read some really early Afrocentric stuff that was coming out in the late 19th century that was pushing this. And they said, well, wait a minute, we can do one too. We can, we can, we can do this better. You know, that's a good question. I've always wondered that. I think, I think you found a new project for me, <laughs> something else I could invest my time in because I've always kind of wondered that myself, like who came up with that first, because the, whoever came second, in my opinion, it looks like it was just a response to that. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, well, we'll just take what they're saying and we'll flip it on its head. You know, like yeah. um, the uh, the white supremacists saying that they came from Atlantis. Yeah, right? well, they're the latecomers. No one believes them. Because <laughs> <laughs> they don't like the truth, man. But you know what I like to say? What's that, Curly? The truth is like medicine. It doesn't always taste good, but it's always good for you. Watcha. See you in Atlantis. Nice. Thank you for listening to Tales from Atlantis, a project of the Chimali Institute of Mesoamerican Arts. If you enjoy the show, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. You can do this by visiting talesfromastlantis.com and clicking support the podcast. Your continued support will help keep the podcast ad-free and independent. Until next time, Timoitase. <laughs>